Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS. It has been our endeavor at Byju's to help and support IAS aspirants at every stage of their preparation. Lacks of students prepare for this examination, but very few finally make into the list. If I look at this examination and the pattern, we can say that. this most prestigious examination of our country the civil services has two phases first pre selection stage where students prepare for all three levels of this examination prelims examination mains examination and then personality test and after that journey does not end there is post selection preparation also so what it takes to crack this examination that is pre selection stage how to effectively crack all three stages of this examination and once selected what it takes to be an extraordinary civil servant we need to have a holistic perspective and views about different dimensions different ways different requirements expected from a student we at byju's have constantly tried to innovate and bring new ideas to make this journey a pleasant journey for the students who are preparing and also the students they get a holistic view about this examination now who else can give us a comprehensive and holistic perspective about this examination other than who himself was a civil servant and ias officer and that too he was also chairman of upsc till 2016 so at byju's today we are going to discuss different aspects of this examination and also once you are selected what is expected what should be your approach towards the civil services to be a an extraordinary civil servant today we are joined by a very distinguished civil servant retired ias officer mr deepak gupta sir was chairman of upsc between 2014 and 16 presently sir is honorary director general National Solar Energy Federation of India. Welcome to Byju's IAS, sir. We are really honored and privileged to have you in our series. It's a pleasure, sir. Sir, usually when um, a bachelor or a graduate thinks about career options, civil services invariably comes into the mind. But the obvious question is, why one should join IAS? Would you like to share why did you join it? well you know those were different times from today uh, i think uh, we grew up as almost the first generation of independent free democratic india and uh, as you grew up uh, 50s and 60s you know there was a feeling that we must contribute to nation building so how best to do it uh, and my father was in the indian police so we knew a little bit about the services and the ias etc politics was out of the question and uh, we could not become a vikram sara bhai or a homi bhaba so what was the best alternative and uh, we then felt that the ias was the one the foreign service or the ias foreign service because it uh, gave you the opportunity to represent your country and we were very proud of this country you know so we thought of the ias and uh, there was the feeling and uh, because my father became a sort of role model for us the way he worked the way he did work and we thought that you could also do good public service uh, which we need to do so the contribution to nation building and public service sort of combined mm -hmm. and then the ias was a good job if you join the government you know you are in leadership positions right from the beginning you are responsible for things which happen for things to get done 
is a wide variety of experience and I think that's very important. I'm not going to collect tax for the rest of my life. Every posting will be different. And this becomes a great challenge, mm -hmm. uh, also a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. So combined, or if you combine all these things, it was a sort of a magnet <laughs> that you... And then life became like uh, sitting to become a public servant. Good. And I would still recommend it. Now, of course, there are a lot of opportunities for people, good opportunities, which were not there at that time. Mm -hmm. But if you want to render public service, if you want to serve the country, I would still recommend the IAS. Great. Thank you, sir. So now that you are now retired, how do you look back at your journey in the IAS? Well, whatever were the reasons why we joined the IAS, I think they were fully realized. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had a fascinating time, never a dull moment. It has been constant challenge, constant change, great opportunities for doing good work. And we feel um, after having served 39 years that, yes, we did a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried to contribute to nation building and a variety of experiences. I've traveled a lot in villages of India in the backward areas. So at the same time, I've interacted with international people and addressed international audiences, represented my country in international conferences. So the whole gamut of experience has been so good. Uh, and um, that it, it really was a lifetime of satisfaction. Great. So means it uh, IS is an opportunity where uh, there is no scope of any monotony. Not at all. It's the one job where there is no monotony. Great. Yes. Sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, there is one question that I would like to ask that relates to post-selection, district posting, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, very important for an IS officer. Tell us something about your experience in the district and how a young IAS who gets recruited or gets selected these days can better handle the challenges, because now challenges have also uh, changed, diversified. What is your recommendation for to them? So I think you see a uh, lot of people actually say that the real value of the Indian administrative service lies in the district. Right. Uh, and we say also that first 10 to 15 years, you should be serving in the field. Uh, that is where your major contribution is. When the Indian Civil Service started, you know, in mm -hmm. the British times, right. it was called a service with basically a district cadre with a few posts in the secretariat. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, people for various reasons want to go uh, to secretariat, but that is where the action is. District is where the action is, where, you know, it's full of life. Uh, so, uh, district is very important for the service and the area might be small. But mm -hmm. contribution, all these schemes are implemented in the district. So the contribution is very much more. And now, uh, even in the British times, people wanted young officers to go. So life in the district should not be easy. Right. You have, you know, it is difficult. Right. In our time, there mm -hmm. was many places, there was no electricity. And of course, no, none of these facilities were there. So a young officer has the energy has the enthusiasm to run around and, you know, sort of work without any anything to constrain him. Uh, that is what is required. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think uh, every IAS officer, he should look forward to going to the field and he has to go all out and he will never forget his district experience. There is so much that we can contribute. Great. And I think this is what also gives the IAS officer the experience then to work in the state and in the center because this experience no other service gets. In fact, no other job in the government. Right. Yes. Great. Sir, you talked about contribution. You wanted to contribute to the nation and uh, uh, solve the challenges and resolve the issues. For this, we need to have a great degree of professionalism. But sir, nowadays what we are witnessing, frequent transfers. I am posted in a district. By the time I get acclimatized and adjusted, I am shifted to some other place. How to get that professionalism now, sir? And how do you look at it? 
well, this is an occupational hazard. Right. Uh, working in the field, uh, even if you are posted to two districts or three districts at short interval, there you are the expert. I think the IAS officer becomes the expert in running a district or a subdivision or doing development at that level. Mm -hmm. It is later on in life and at your career that professionalism becomes very important. Because um, now if I want to be energy or health, mm -hmm. then I should normally go into the health department in the state. Mm -hmm. My training opportunities should be related to health. I should be allowed if I want to do higher study in health matter. There are many opportunities. And then I, government of India, I should come to health. So that will give me the professional experience. And I already have the experience of the field, mm -hmm. which tells me what is the difficulty in a primary health center, health sub-center, what are the malnutrition, you know, all these things. So government needs to encourage this development of professionalism in the service. I fully agree. Mm -hmm. You can't say on the one hand that you are not professional enough. And in the other, you don't allow me to become a professional and then say I have to get people from lateral entry mm -hmm. because you're not professional. Mm -hmm. This is one of the challenges. Governments must for better administration and good governance ensure that all IAS officers are professionally competent in mm -hmm. different fields. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it should also then become part of their empanelment and promotion procedure. If I am not a professional in anything, you are of no use. Right, right. So that must be encouraged. Absolutely, must be encouraged. Absolutely. And I have suggested in my book uh, some ways of how that can be done. done. Great, sir. Sir, you talked about uh, lateral entry and uh, recruiting from outside the system. Do you think it is a bit risky? Because uh, those people who have worked for a long period in a private sector, private sector has different orientation. Public sector or public service requires different orientation. So how do you look at this lateral entry thing? It's a, it's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. And I think people have not really studied the, it. Okay. Uh, you are simply saying that the IAS people are not professional. Mm -hmm. World requires professionals, therefore mm -hmm. get people in. Mm -hmm. That's, it's not correct because as you are saying, the work of the IAS officer or anybody else in the position in the secretariat or government is quite different. Right. It is policy making, it is coordination, it is ensuring a budget, it is getting people together. Right. It is finding out the best way that we have pros and cons and a subject is examined. Then I have to communicate it, I have to get it approved and then I have to go along to get it implemented. Right. And the IAS officer in a sense having been through the field and has the best experience. So I'm not saying that this may not be necessarily true for say telecom. Right. But for a large portion of the government system, this experience and a professionalism will give you the best actually, the best experience. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been celebrated essays by management experts who have said that a person who may be a professional in the private sector or even an academic institute quite likely to fail in government <laughs> because he is not used to the system. Mm -hmm. And secondly, as you go up into the service, any place, you are sort of looking at the coordinating role becomes more important. Mm -hmm. And a specialist sees less and less a tunnel view. of a particular subject because yes, tunnel view. Right. The tunnel keeps getting, you know, just smaller and smaller for a specialist. Right. So a specialist need not, if I have to have a health secretary, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. will he be a physiotherapist, will he be a heart surgeon, will he be a mental health specialist, what will he be? And then they have said that you tend to give more focus to the special speciality to which you belong. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is possible conflict of interest right. between movement from the private sector back and forth. Correct. Uh, and maybe ultimately what will happen, people in the IAS will leave and join the private sector, which is also not a very good Hel thing. Yeah, right. Yes. So clash of interest is... Yes, I think conflict of interest inherent. The problem is that you have great shortage of officers. Mm -hmm. So the problem has to be resolved there. Get more people into the service 
and get them professionalized. That right. is the solution. Right. Even sanction strength is also very less. Six thousand. Yes. Even sanction strength is uh, uh, less. And remember, one third of this is state civil service people who are promoted from the state civil service at the fag end of their careers. Okay. So, so one third of the cadre cannot be professional in in one way. Right. right. So. These are the real problems actually which need to be addressed. Addressed. Great. Thank you, sir. Now, sir, coming back to uh, one pre-selection stage, there is a rumor, there is a myth that age, if I have to get selected in civil services, uh, I, have, I, I must start preparing early. And uh, is there any, does age play any role in the selection of uh, or in preparation? When should I start? Does age has any role? No, there are two two questions which you are asking. Right, sir. Uh, whether there is a preference in the system for age. Mm -hmm. Now, there is no bias towards age. Right. right. Because anybody who comes, I mean, in the UPSC, they would see the merit of the candidate. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Only his or her merit. Mm -hmm. But this system requires younger people. Right. right. I, very interestingly, uh, when the when the first examination was first started in Britain in the 1850s, mm -hmm. age became the biggest point of discussion. What age I should get people in? And their view was that I should get younger and younger people because the job requires young people. Mm -hmm. And the same thing continues to apply today. Mm -hmm. uh, young because you are, as I said, enthusiastic, you are, you know, the other... Many experts have said that if you have already been in some jobs and you are 4, 5, 6, 28, 27, your minds and ideas are fixed. Your way of thinking is fixed. Very difficult to change that kind of thing and that's not desirable. And a very important thing is, and I think people don't give adequate attention to, mm -hmm. if I am 28 at entry and you are 23, Right. You will become secretary to government. I will never be. Right. So I will never reach the top positions, mm -hmm. whether in the state or in the center. Correct. So the biggest incentive to good work is to reach the highest position. Mm -hmm. That has gone away. Mm -hmm. So uh, people must, and it is really harmful for people from OBC or SCST, I feel, because if you take them at even higher ages, which you are trying because you have given so many attempts and age uh, concession, they will never reach the top because they will retire. Mm -hmm. And we need all people to go to the top. Correct. So this is also a very important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. age has many other consequences. Right. Right. But I read the other day the UPSC 2019 report which says that proportion of male students who are qualifying has increased to mm -hmm. 26, 27, which I think is not a very good sign. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, sir. Now, sir, there are questions about ethical dilemmas that a civil servant, while performing his duty, faces. The ethical dilemma between my privately held views and the social obligations as held by the organization. So, have you also faced any such ethical dilemma or if someone faces that ethical dilemma regarding ethical values, ethical rules, how to get it resolved and what uh, what would be your suggestion to resolve such ethical dilemmas? If it's a purely ethical dilemma, mm -hmm. where no policy or ideology is coming in, mm -hmm. then there is no dilemma. Right. I must do the right thing, period. Mm -hmm. and Everybody knows what is the right thing. You might construct excuses if you want to do something else. So I must do the right thing. If I'm in the district and minister wants or somebody else wants me to do the wrong thing, mm -hmm. I should not do it. Simple. Right. You transfer me. Mm -hmm. I should be willing to be transferred. So I think there, in my view, there is no dilemma. Mm -hmm. You have to do the right thing or go away. Now, there might be a difference in policy. Right. So, your job, and, and this Sardar Patel also said that this my secretary should give me advice even if it is contrary to my views. So, your responsibility is to give your views frankly 
in the best way possible. That this is the right thing to do, these are the pros and cons. But even after that, if the government takes a decision that this should be the policy, then it's your job then to implement it. And if you don't agree with it at all, once again, you then you leave because, you know, you, right. you have to, you are not the government. Right. So your job is to try and tell in your view and why, what is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you know, you have to be prepared for some difficulties if you don't agree. And you always have a choice. You always have a choice. Right. You know, I mentioned in my district, first thing, the person there had asked me, mm -hmm. not a very serious conflict. He said, uh, he had asked for transfers and all that. I said, I can't do transfers. I'm running the district. I'm district magistrate. I have to run my district. Mm -hmm. He didn't like it. He wanted to run the district. So I said, my bags are packed. You ask the minister, I, I'm happy to go away. So that you have to be prepared. Great. Thank you, sir. Now, sir, the question is related to the criticism of the IAS. Yes. <laughs> uh, like these are, um, again, non-professional and uh, they are, after working in field for 15 years, they are totally detached from the field. And once they start making policy, they have uh, very um, less view or less uh, perspective about what is happening actually on the ground. Other criticisms are also there. So, how do we react to that? There are two things. There is genuine reason to criticize. Right. And uh, I think what people criticize the most is the so-called arrogant attitude. And I know everything. That attitude and that is criticism is valid. And we must tell IAS officers, you can be proud of your work and your service, but you cannot be arrogant. Mm. Secondly, don't think you know everything. You don't. Uh, and so it's so these are the two main criticisms. Professionalism we have already discussed. Right, sir. But the important part of a all India service is that I then go back, I keep coming to the center and state. I was in the health ministry. I was looking after tuberculosis. So I was uh, visiting all the states. And uh, my colleague was posted in the health department in the state before again coming to the center. So you are getting a view of the state. It's not that once you have finished your field work, you are away from that. And constantly you are interacting with people in the field. So this is not a proper Val valid criticism. criticism right, yes. Sir. And I think uh, people, when uh, criticize the bureaucracy, uh, they criticize the IAS as if everything, and uh, they say abolish this service, as if all India's problems will be resolved simply by abolishing this service. So I mm -hmm. think criticism of the service is sometimes uh, just not well informed. Right. Uh, we, there is a role for the IAS. It is important that we play the role well for good governance in this country. So mm -hmm. that part you should strengthen. Right. And I think you people and others are trying to bring out what good work officers are doing. I think that is very right. essential. It should come out in the public domain. Hundreds of people are doing very good work. And people should get a better idea of what is their contribution. So mm -hmm. that image should change. Right. You know, there are World Bank studies over 15 years ago of lot of reforms and policy initiatives in states. Mm -hmm. And they have come to the inclusion that every success, there was an IAS officer behind it. But he was enabled by the polit political leadership of that time. Right. And an environment was created. So that is a win-win. Mm -hmm. That will be a win-win. Right. So uh, in that sense, sir, you are actually telling the young aspirants also, one, to be humble. Don't yes. get, don't be Absolutely. arrogant. Always ready to learn. Must all, all your life. And do homework before you take on any. Yes. So this is uh, applicable equally at pre-selection yes. stage also and post-selection yes, stage. Yes, you must. Uh, you, uh, if you think you are so great, then be competent <laughs> in your subject. Be competent. Right. Sir. And uh, we must have empathy. Mm -hmm. After a large portion of this country and whom you are dealing with is poor, marginalized. You have to bring up them. So you have to have empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. So right. yes, IAS officers must, uh, must realize that uh, just becoming an IAS officer is only part of the journey. 
then doing your job is the more important part thank you sir sir now we are into the age of globalization privatization and liberalization lots of activities which were being performed by the government hither to are being outsourced to private sector so do what do you think role of civil services is reducing in our country so uh, the role of the state and there is a lot of discussion globally there was a view when the soviet union collapsed mm -hmm. and uh, there was this big story of end of history that liberalism and market has won and you know they have solutions for everything now it is going back no state is important and if the pandemic has any lesson it shows that the state's role is critical and therefore mm -hmm. the role of the services in that sense is not reducing, reducing. Mm -hmm. uh, it is and the challenges that are coming forward of climate change and others so it is not reducing uh, as far as privatization is concerned you then have to become an enabler and a facilitator mm -hmm. so that part there is a part change also but if i need to develop my health systems a lot of it has to be done by the state mm -hmm. but there is another sense in which the role is reducing which is that you are giving lesser importance to what the civil service is not saying because mm -hmm. of too much of politicization they uh, tv channels and media only talks of politicians and elections etc mm -hmm. they they they're not talking of the good and bad things that are happening mm -hmm. or policies mm -hmm. because you are not giving importance to that so in that sense the importance of the civil services in general is declining Definitely. which is not a good thing, good thing. in my view sir now sir there is one question with relates to uh, the nexus that we find because is officers they have to closely work with the politicians and the political class at every stage of their career so invariably that develops a kind of relationship at times that relationship is good but at times it is it becomes a, a nexus also unholy nexus and by which the real spirit of policy is uh, uh, defeated yes. how to break that sir it's very difficult uh uh it just all the things that we have discussed that you should be a professional if you are a professional hopefully you won't develop that nexus i'm saying the guiding principle is do right mm -hmm. so if you believe in doing right then the nexus won't develop right we are talking of ethical behavior so i must emphasize right in the initial training and continuously over the career about the ethical behavior mm -hmm. so if you have all these things and the system recognizes merit mm -hmm. i have recommended for example that people who are not promoted or empaneled right. they should be pensioned off so we will find a way 10 15 people who are networking doing well rising to the top they will be pensioned off mm -hmm. uh, they will not get promotion mm -hmm. so only good people will get promotion Mm -hmm. so these are uh, kind of a few ways in which you know we can ensure that there is no nexus and the system also should not politicize that's what i'm saying right we should not politicize too much we should discuss policies we should not discuss personalities and politics all the time right yes sir thank you sir now sir as a student i am preparing for 3 years 4 years because government anyway gives me um, good number of years to prepare for that i am not supporting my family i am residing in delhi or anywhere and simply i am still dependent at the age of 26 27 28 is it justified just in the name of preparation of civil services well uh, this is a matter of individual choice so uh, i can't say it mm -hmm. but uh, <clears throat> you are seeing that uh, every year about 10 11 lakh people apply 5 or 6 lakh right so see mm -hmm. where is that missing 5 6 lakh people they are preparing and not sitting and spending money that's not a good thing and you have given so many attempts so it's almost become a profession to keep sitting for the service i think that's not all good thing also right so people should uh, realize i mean try for the service it's not the end of the world 
and have a plan B which is ready and you, you are right there are uh, difficulties family responsibilities and so. difficulties and but these are individual choices people right, have sir. to take a view <laughs> I sir. can't say sir. much on that sir yeah objectively cannot yes, be said yes, yeah yes sir I am introvert type of person mm. I don't speak much but the demand of the services I have to communicate with strangers I may be posted in a state where I have no connection with in my past from uh, in my past so how to improve one's communication skills sir I think this uh, some expert would uh, have to answer this mm -hmm. uh, I may be an introvert but I must be a, I may be a very deep person and I may be doing my job well but I think communication and talking to people and meeting them and interacting them is an essential part if I'm in the field I am talking to people or communicating with them uh, most of the time right so Generally, as a student, mm -hmm. uh, nothing to do with the exams also, I have been saying, uh, practice your communication skills, practice mm -hmm. your reading, writing, talking, speaking. Right. So, you get into the habit mm -hmm. of talking to people, arguing your case. Uh, if you start arguing your case, you get into the habit of telling people why I am doing this. Right. Sir. And so that will lead to a better communication. And I think uh, in the in the academy, as a part of the training process, they should uh, we should try and hone the communication skills, skills also. Right, sir. Yes, yes. And this is the last question I would like to take your view on. Would you like to give some message? What message would you like to give to the students who are planning to join the civil services or planning to start their preparation? What message would you like to give? Well, everything that we have discussed right from the very beginning Sir. is a message to them. Sir. Why should you join the service? Uh, what is expected of you as an officer? How you can make better contribution? And for the preparation, uh, I think, uh, as I said, of course, our times were different. You, uh, you make your career choice early. Uh, prepare over a period of time not three or four years, but be competent in the subjects which you have studied, which will be your... Right. Because unlike engineering students, they do geography and all that. Uh, and prepare yourself, which is for the skills I'm talking about of reading, writing, talking, speaking. I think these are essential. Be good in your language, mm -hmm. whether it's your mother tongue or English, right. because I'm sitting talking to you. I must be able to do that. Right. Uh, because you'll be talking to the... Uh, Secretary Energy from the United States. Right. How do you talk to him? Right. So uh, prepare yourself. Do comprehension questions. Do logical questions. Do pressy writing. These are all mental preparation of opening up the mind mm -hmm. and making the ability of the mind to absorb, etc. much more. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, try to have a well-rounded personality follow your interests, follow your hobbies. Mm -hmm. These are all important things. I'm not, they're the same, no? Right. <laughs> all, what is that, Jack? Uh, jack of all trades. Uh, no, no, not Jack of all trades. No, no, became uh, uh, working all the time. Yes, sir. You know, that, uh, so, you have to be a normal person, but with a well-rounded personality, with interest in life, and improve yourself in every way. It will help you. It will help you in the exam, other exams, and help you in preparation for life, probably make you a more capable person. Right. Thank you so very much, sir. Not Thank you, sir. Hopefully, this uh, candid conversation with uh, Deepak Gupta, sir, will help the students who are preparing for the civil services examination or who are planning to start to have a holistic perspective about this service, not only about pre-selection stage, but also about post-selection stage. Because as sir rightly said, Actually, there is no fundamental difference between the two. You have to do right things at both stages. You have to be professional at both stages. You should pursue, you should develop your personality at both stages. So thereby, there is no fundamental difference between the two, as Sir rightly said. Thank you, Sir. Thank, Thank you so you. very much. Thank you. Thank you.